is 9.44 a.m. and we're back on the record. Okay, so we were talking before we took the break, Mr. Ricklin, about um, the role of the sales representative as an educator. And uh, you were saying that uh, sales, I don't um, tell, tell me again if you would, what, is, what did you mean when you said that the sales representative is an educator? Well, I think they play a, value fu a valuable function in providing you know, drug-specific information to physicians uh, who, especially with a new product, uh, you know, they have sources of information, but um, a, a re sales representative can bring them materials that help to ensure appropriate use of the product. Mm -hmm. uh, that may mean something about anything from drug interactions to um, how to titrate a product, uh, appropriate doses or what the dosing ranges are as recommended in the labeling for the product. Um, I don't think most physicians are going to take the time to sit down and read the entire package insert mm -hmm. for a new product. And our sales representatives have gone through the training to understand that language and serve as a resource for that. But as I said, they don't always have the answer but they have access to those answers uh, if, they, if they can't answer questions. So I think that is one, one of the valuable aspects of, of a sales representative. If a physician takes the time to listen to them, and unfortunately, as you probably know, uh, time is frequently limited uh, for the interaction between a physician and a sales representative. Right. and, and Oftentimes, the interactions between a sales representative and a physician may be, you know, measured in terms of minutes, one, two, three, four minutes, something like that, right? It, it can be, yes. Did, did, while you were at Mallinckrodt, did you, <coughs> did Mallinckrodt undertake to uh, figure out what the average time of interaction between a sales representative and a physician would be? To my knowledge, they did not. Do you know um, what the average time of interaction between a sales rep representative and a uh, physician was in general terms during the time you were at Mellencroft? I think that there was an industry suggestion uh, that most interactions were in the range of only a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. uh, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, as an industry, we try to get more time with physicians to be able to provide a full message, and that was accomplished by trying to um, either catch the physician during uh, a break, uh, during lunch, uh, dinner meetings were sometimes held if they were interested in coming to a, a speaker program, so there were also efforts to educate using peer-to-peer. Uh, education as well. Okay. And in the communications between sales representatives and physicians or other prescribers, uh, you, you mentioned this term fair balance, right? Does that, what does that mean in terms of the interactions between the sales representatives and the physicians and other prescribers? Well, I, I think I replied to that question earlier, but um, Fair balance, in my mind, always was a balance between what the risks of products were and also what the benefits could be, because I think that's the equation that physicians use in their head whenever they're prescribing a product, is to evaluate what the benefits are versus what the risks are, mm -hmm. understanding that all pharmaceutical prescription products have risks as well as benefits. Who determined what risks the sales representatives should discuss with physicians? Well, it would have been all the people that were, were responsible and approved the promotional materials. Mm -hmm. So it went through a review board uh, that included uh, representatives from our medical departments, from legal, from regulatory, from marketing, um, and compliance. Uh, there were maybe others that 
I, w I was never on those boards mm -hmm. as a salesperson. Uh, they didn't uh, think that was something that was our responsibility. I mean, it wasn't a responsibility of the sales division to, to develop the message. And, and to, it wasn't the responsibility of the sales division. Oh, I'm sorry, was it a division? How did you think of your sales group? Mark, just with Malincrot. <coughs> sorry, I'm talking about Malincrot. Okay. Yeah, but unless I specify, let me just say this so we're all clear. Unless I specify otherwise, I'm, I'm talking about your time at Malincrot. Okay. Uh, Ms. Scullane will ask about your time at Endo. Okay. Um, so if I'm not careful and delineate that for each question, that's what I'm intending to do. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, so could you repeat the question? Sure. Uh, it wasn't the responsibility of the sales division at Mallinckrodt to determine which risks the sales representatives would discuss with the physicians, is that right? All the marketing materials were created by a board of individuals uh, made up from the departments that I just mentioned. Did the sales division have any role in determining which risks the sales representatives would discuss with physicians? No, I mean, sometimes that was dictated by the customer mm. uh, asking the questions. Um, the customer being the physician? Yes. Uh, during the launch of uh, Exalgo, which we're talking about Malincrod here, mm. I think the entire first visit that we had during the launch was strictly talking about risks. Risks specific to Exalgo? As in the, we went through, I think there were eight or nine points that were in a black box warning for the product. And so that was, we were trained uh, that the, on those first visits as we went around and, and introduced the product. Mm -hmm. It was really to, we couldn't talk about the product until we had gone through all the risks that were outlined in the black box. You, uh, as the Vice President of Sales, knew at Mallinckrodt, knew that physicians would rely on the information that the sales representatives gave them, at least in part, when deciding whether to prescribe a drug for a patient. Is that right? Objection as to form. Um, certainly, we were one resource. I, don't, I do not think that physicians used pharmaceutical representatives as their sole source. Sure. Uh, but you knew that, at least in part, physicians were relying on sales representatives to give them uh, truthful and accurate information about the risks and benefits of the product when deciding whether to prescribe the product for the physician's patients. Right. I think that physicians um, always kept a little bit of a jaundiced eye Mm -hmm. on promotional materials, um, probably not understanding the process for how they were developed and the reviews, legal and medical, that they went through. Mm -hmm. um, but they certainly would challenge information, and I always thought that was good. Mm -hmm. That gave you the opportunity to have a dialogue and help you to understand concerns of physicians and to better answer and, and help them understand the product. The goal of the sales department, is it a department or division? How did you think of it at Mallinckrodt? Um, they were departments, but there were very clear distinctions between certain departments. Yeah, what do you mean by uh, for, that? For example, in this grid that you show, an organizational chart. Exhibit that, 2 we're talking about? I'm sorry. Yes, yes Exhibit okay. 2. That really was just the commercial side of the business. It didn't include anybody from, legal, uh, from medical, legal, regulatory, scientific affairs, all which had very distinct functions and roles as well. Um, and there was very little interaction between our department as a sales department and uh, those others, uh, other than for training purposes. They played an active role in the training and they played an active role in the development of the materials that we were, were provided. The goal of the sales department was to increase the number of prescriptions written for Mallinckrodt products, right? Objection as to form. Well, I mean, there, there, um, 
the, the primary role of the sales organization was to educate physicians and um, position the product versus competitive products. Uh, then it was up to the physician to decide whether or not this product provided any benefits versus other competitive products. Mm -hmm. okay. How were sales representatives evaluated while you were at Mellencron? They had sales representatives uh, at Mellencron um, had a district manager mm -hmm. uh, who would spend time with them. Um, they were evaluated on communications within sharing ideas within their district, uh, being uh, uh, helpful during um, management meetings, um, you know, frequency of which uh, they utilize the resources available from the home office, um, such as scientific affairs, helping to connect customers with um, uh, with resources within the company. Mm -hmm. Understanding the payer environment uh, was a big part of uh, their evaluation as well. Being a resource to the physicians did, did as best possible. Was that payer environment? Payer. Okay. The uh, person who pays for the prescription? Insurance companies. Okay. Sales representatives were given bonuses based on how many prescriptions for Mallinckrodt products were written within their territory, right? Objection as to form. Go ahead. Sales representatives had a compensation system that was primarily made up of a base salary. Mm -hmm. uh, and then depending upon the company or depending upon the time, uh, there was about 20 to 25 percent of their compensation that uh, was represented by incentive compensation. Mm -hmm. But that could have been multiple products and, and sometimes at Mallinckrodt it was as many as four products. So okay. it was divided up over those products. The amount of the bonuses for sales representatives at Mallinckrodt was based on how many prescriptions for Mallinckrodt products were written within the sales representative's territory, right? Objection as to form. Go ahead. Um, compensation is a pretty complicated um, no. part of the business, actually. Right. I was just talking about bonuses. I, that's and. and uh, Bonuses were even more complicated. Okay. Um, we hired outside vendors usually to put together incentive compensation for our representatives. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were weightings against different products, depending upon the amount of promotional time that they got. And how they were compensated could be a mix of several different things. Um, in the majority of cases, uh, at least at Mallinckrodt, uh, we were measuring Exalgo sales versus uh, our competitors. And so a primary aspect of that of compensation was market share. How much were we able to garner from other medications that were out there? Because that product was only indicated for patients who had already been on other opioids. So our, our, our strategy as a company was to take market share away from other products. So market share became a, a big uh, part of the compensation system. The compensation plans went out um, quarterly mm -hmm. uh, or every three, four months, depending on the time frame. And so they did change from time to time. I'd have to see an actual compensation plan to tell you how that one was, was created. Okay. So in general terms at Mallinckrodt, the more prescriptions for Mallinckrodt products that were written in a territory, the more money the sales representative would earn. Objection as to form. Yeah, I, 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 that's not a, totally true. Uh, it is partially true. There were other factors. Okay. Uh, what was the biggest factor in determining sales representatives' compensation while you're at Mallinckrodt? Was it number of prescriptions written in the territory? Um, as I said previously, every plan changed, and so I'd have to go back and look at a specific plan to be able to answer that question for you. But um, 
certainly total RXs were one component, but it may have been one of several components. Okay. Was it ever in your memory that total prescriptions written for a Mallinckrodt product was not the majority component in assessing compensation for a sales representative? Well, I'm not sure. We, we had some products that we were co-promoting with other companies and they had their own incentive plans um, that, that we adopted or that they recommended how we did it. And so um, you talked about all products and I, every product was a little bit different. But certainly, as a sales department, mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, department is responsible for helping to grow the appropriate use of all products. Okay, I may have missed your answer in there. Uh, let me ask it a different way. When you were at Mallinckrodt, was the number of prescriptions written in a territory the primary component in determining the compensation for the sales representatives? Objection is to form. The answer is probably not. Okay. What was the primary component in your memory? I'm not sure that there was a primary component. Okay. It was usually a combination of components. Was the number of prescriptions for Mallinckrodt products a substantial factor in determining sales representatives compensation while you're at Mallinckrodt? Objection as to form. Are you talking about all compensation? I'm talking about sales representatives compensation. Well, the base salary was their primary uh, source of compensation. Okay. Uh, let's talk about then bonuses. Was the number of prescriptions for Mallinckrodt products written in a sales representative's territory a substantial factor in determining the sales representative's bonus when you were at Mallinckrodt? Objection as to form. Uh, the number of prescriptions frequently was broken out into total prescriptions. Mm -hmm. So once a patient was put on a product, uh, they may be on that product for some period of time. And so we did at times uh, distinguish between new prescriptions versus ongoing prescriptions. Um, and so that was one aspect of, of uh, the compensation as well was uh, market share. And um, frequently market share was at least uh, as, as great a part of the compensation as were the number of prescriptions. Okay, so market share, when you say market share you mean converting uh, physicians who are writing prescriptions for competitors' products to physicians who are writing prescriptions for Malacron products? Yes, we, we did have a identified group of products that we uh, considered competitors. Mm -hmm. uh, for Exalgo, it was long-acting products that um, frequently were products that were written once or twice a day. Uh, the nature of their product allowed them to be used. Um, they were considered medium to strong opioids and that they uh, were had some kind of perhaps uh, slow or delayed release that allowed them to be used less frequently. Mm. And so we had identified products that we had, uh, uh, were specifically trying to gain market share from. So replace what the doctor was currently using with Exalgo, but it was always a replacement because our product was only indicated for patients who had already been previously put on an opioid. Okay. They couldn't be opioid naive. That was in the language of the, pr of the uh, package insert, and uh, we, we certainly made sure that our representatives understood that. So with respect to Exalgo, mm -hmm. The goal, or one goal of the sales department was to uh, persuade doctors to prescribe Exalgo for patients for whom they were already prescribing a competitor's opioid. Objection as to form. Could you rephrase it? Sure. Or just repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, with respect to Exalgo, one of the goals of the sales department was to persuade doctors who were already prescribing a competitor's opioid product to prescribe Exalgo. 
Judge no, has I, to form. <laughs> you know, I, I guess I would uh, take exception to the word persuade. Ah, okay. Um, it was what to word educate. Would you, okay. And uh, help them understand the differences mm -hmm. between Exalgo and the products that they were currently using. Mm -hmm. It was always up to the physician to, s to weigh the benefits and risks of that product versus products that they were already using. The sales team, the sales representatives at Mallinckrodt were instructed that they should ask at the end of the interaction with the physician, they should ask the physician to prescribe Exalgo, right? Um, not specifically. Um, we had gone through, uh, you know, there, for, for some companies, and I was not a believer of this, mm -hmm. is to, you know, use a statement like, you know, will you try it on the next several number of patients where mm -hmm. you think it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, we always felt that at Mallinckrodt that was a little bit, um, sounded like a, a canned request that physicians objected to hearing mm -hmm. um, and so we would say things like you know more like uh, doctor do you possibly see a place for this product in your current armamentarium uh, if so would you consider prescribing it You said, do you possibly see a place for this product in, in what? Your armamentarium of products. Armamentarium. Is that the word you used? I don't I know that that was a specific word. That's the word I use. Yeah, no, I'm just, I, I, I've never heard that word before. Okay. What does that mean? Um, it's the, the, the full spectrum mm -hmm. of products that you use to treat patients. Well, I'm trying to keep my armamentarium of documents straight over here. <laughs> I could send the sales rep to help you. <laughs> I might need that. Yeah. <laughs> this one? Okay. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Which is the next one you want to use? 7647? This one? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The um, at Mallinckrodt, the sales representatives were given uh, other um, things for meeting certain uh, goals. Is that right? For example, uh, there's something called the President's Club. Do you yes. remember that? Yes. What is the President's president. Club? Um, it was identified as those representatives who were ranked in the top 5%, I think. What do you mean ranked in the top 5%? Uh, depending upon whatever the criteria were for that year. Each sales representative uh, was given a goal uh, in terms of number of prescriptions that are written in their territory, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would have to go back and look at the compensation plans again. Mm -hmm. um, prescriptions were probably one component. Uh, there may have been other components as well. Okay, were, do you recall there being quarterly sales goals set at Mallinckrodt while you were there? Yes, there were. Those were uh, sales goals in terms of the number of prescriptions written, right? That component of it, yes. Yeah. Okay, was there, were there other components to the sales goal? Uh, market share was frequently one. Um, there may have been others, but those would be two primary. Okay, and market share just means the number of prescriptions that are written for Mallinckrodt products by physicians who were previously writing prescriptions for competitor products, right? What that means was whatever the market share of the product was versus where it was and, and where it went to. 
where it started and where it finished. And that was um, I think that we never, I'm not sure that Exalgo ever exceeded more than about three or four percent mm -hmm. market share uh, nationally. But uh, so they were decimal points in difference sometimes mm -hmm. in market share, but that was, it was uh, identifying the, the growth through uh, a replacement of other opioids that were being used. <coughs> Mallinckrodt, like other pharmaceutical companies, had data on every prescription written in the country, right? Um, to the best of our knowledge, I mean, I th there's a projection methodology mm -hmm. that's used by those companies that provide data. It's usually based upon anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of the prescriptions that exist within a geography mm -hmm. and then project it out. Okay. So, so for it's not totally accurate. But this was the data that Mallinckrodt used, at least in part, to, among other things, determine the amount of bonus that was given to sales representatives, right? It was used to measure numbers of prescriptions. Okay. So Mallinckrodt relied on the data? Uh, yes, we had to rely on something and that was mm -hmm. the best data that we had available. Okay. There are commercial companies that aggregate this data and then sell it to pharmaceutical companies? There are. Okay. Uh, part of that data <coughs> is uh, information about how the particular prescription was paid for, is that right? In other words, insurance versus government program versus cash? You, you can buy that as a separate mm -hmm. uh, uh, add-on, um, and I think at Mallinckrodt we did have that information. And so Mallinckrodt, during the time you were there, knew uh, what, in general terms, what percentage of their prescriptions were being paid for in cash? Injection has to form. In paid for in cash? In cash, yes sir. Um, I think that you know we had information on on payer cash is sometimes maybe hard to pick up. Uh, mm -hmm. You had some projections once again as to what how much was government pay, how much was private pay, and then subtracted out of that would have been what was assumed to be cash pay. Why was that information important to Mallinckrodt? Um, the information on payers was used um, really to help understand the kinds of questions that a physician might ask, uh, such as, is this product covered by Medicaid? Or is it a covered by Blue Cross? Mm -hmm. And the more that uh, third-party payers were involved, the more you knew that you had to have you know, information on a lot of the private payers to be able to share. Mm -hmm. Because, especially in the pain environment, there's nothing worse for a doctor than writing a prescription for a patient in pain, having them go to the pharmacy and find out that either it's not available or their insurance company doesn't pay for them. That requires then the pharmacy to follow up with a phone call to the physician. It might require the physician then seeing the patient again. It just creates a lot of problems and they were pretty reluctant to write a product that they didn't think it was going to be available or compensated for. Okay. Let's go back and talk for a minute about sales goals during the time you were at Mallinckrodt. Uh, sales goals were set for a particular geographic area based on three factors, is that right? You, you, I don't recall the specifics. You don't, no. Okay, well let me let me tell you three factors and tell me if this is consistent with your memory, okay? Sales goals uh, at Mellencrot were set based on three factors. One, the number of physicians who could potentially write prescriptions for the particular pharmaceutical in the market. Number two, how many of these physicians were viable targets. And three, historical performance or the volume of the pharmaceutical the district had historically brought in. Is that consistent with your memory of your time at Mallinckrodt? Um, are you reading from one specific 
plan? No, I'm, I'm reading from a uh, legal brief filed in a federal appeals court with the site 2016 WL 7210642. And this is a brief filed by lawyers for uh, COVIDian in 2016. Okay, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that document, I don't think, so. Right, are you familiar with those concepts I just read to you? Um, could you read them to me again? Sure, do you, let me ask it a different way before I do that. Do you recall how sale, quarterly sales goals for a district were set during the time you were at Mallinckrodt? Well, once again, you'd have to go back to the specific plan okay. and, and look at what was decided in the plan. Okay. Who set the plans for quarterly sales goals? Uh, we actually had a separate analytics department mm -hmm. that uh, created the plans and set the goals, uh, and they were separate. Not e they were not even in the commercial group. They were uh, another group of people that there was a wall between us and you know the goal setting process. Okay, <coughs> were you involved in setting? quarterly sales goals while you were at uh, Mallinckrodt? No, I was not. So those just came to you and you uh, helped your people meet them? The goals were established usually in um, discussions with um, the executive team above me. While you were at Mallinckrodt, do you recall that the sales performance was also measured by ranking the volume or the actual number of prescriptions coming out of each, di each district? Um, no, I mean, there were different expectations for different geographies. Mm -hmm. Not all geography was created the same. Um, and so, and, and some products had more, uh, more prescribers in a, in a geographic area than others. And so that would influence the uh, goal setting process. Okay. Was sales performance measured, uh, at least in part, by ranking the actual number of prescriptions coming out of each district while you're at Mallinckrodt? Objection as to form. Yeah, once again, it goes back to the, the components of the compensation plan, mm -hmm. which, as I mentioned before, could have been several different factors and several different products. Mm -hmm. Was, uh, do you recall at any time when you were at Mallinckrodt the actual number of prescriptions uh, being a measurement of performance of a sales representative? It certainly would have been a component. Going back to exhibit number two, which is still up here. I think we've now handed out copies of um, the first page, which is ends in the Bates number 264. Uh, there are three people listed underneath you, Gavin McGowan, Jay Meyer, and William Nichols. Yeah, see that? Okay. What, and, and you'd mentioned at one point that Connie Kissinger was in that Correct. chain of recording. Correct. Was there, um, let's talk about when you first started at Mallinckrodt, was there a geographical division of the country in terms of regions? There, there was. Okay. So you were responsible for the entire country? Correct. Okay, and then there were people who were responsible for different geographic regions? Correct. Okay, you were hesitating. Is there something not right about that? Well, I, it just, I, I, I don't know why you, when you say responsible, oh. Okay. I'm not sure what you mean by responsible. Okay. Um, was the country divided into regions by geography? Yes, it was. Okay, and there was a regional sales director for each of those regions? Yes, there was. Okay. Uh, did that change over time in terms of how the country was set up geographically during yes. your time? Yes, it did. Uh, we went from two to three regions as we added more representatives. Okay. And, and I think the total representatives at one time got as high as 250 and came back down to closer to 200. When was the regional um, 
division or wh when were the regions changed from t three to four? I don't really recall specifically. Do you recall who during your time uh, was the regional sales director for the Ohio area? Was uh, it Mr. Meyer? It, 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 uh, it went between um, Gavin McGowan and Jay Meyer. It did change as the regions got reconfigured. Okay, who, who had it first? Uh, I think Gavin McGowan had it first. And then it fell under, at some point, began to f fall under Mr. Meyer? Correct. Was that area always, was Ohio always part of the Central Division, or was there some other name for it? I can't recall. It may have been divided by, it could have been in separate districts. Uh, it was always probably in the same region. Okay. Was it, I'm sorry, was it the Central Region? Did I say district? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Central Region? Um, you know, once again, the regions changed. Okay. I don't remember how we, how we named them. Uh, specifically, but it, it did get uh, split up into different regions at one time. Okay, so the country during your time at Mallinckrodt, there was you as the vice president of sales over the entire country, right? Correct. And then the, the country was then divided up into regions at some point three and then four, is that right? Uh, two and then three. Sorry, two then then three. Correct. Okay. At some point did it become divided into four? toward the end of your tenure? Not that I recall. And then each region is was subdivided into districts? Correct. Okay. And there was a district manager for each district? Correct. Did some district managers, uh, were they district managers for more than one district or was it one district manager per district? One district manager per district. Okay. And then within the district <coughs> there were sales territories as well, right? Correct. On average, about 10. Okay. So 10 territories per district? On average. Okay. Was there um, one sales representative <coughs> per territory? Um, I think Yes, I don't think that there was any overlap at Mallinckrodt. Were there, um, were the sales rep to reps told what products they should be emphasizing during their interactions with prescribers? There were, based on the, the the goals that had been set for a territory, there might have been different emphasis. Um, it, it certainly, I mean, there were customers that might have been specific to just one product. Um, we sold a product, Pensed, uh, at Mallinckrodt that had an indication for pain, it was a topical product for um, arthritic pain in the knee. And so there were specific, you know, uh, physician types that were identified for that product. Um, and then if they had a lot of physicians of that nature, you know, the weighting of their, their compensation might have been skewed one way or the other based on those products. As I recall, I don't remember all the specifics of that. But Do you ever recall, while you're at Mallinckrodt, a situation where um, the number of prescriptions in a sales territory went up, whether they were uh, new prescriptions or conversion from competitor's product to Mallinckrodt product, and the sales representative's bonuses went down because of the increase in the number of prescriptions? Jack, that's a form. I don't know what, when you say that their compensation went down. Yeah, I said their bonuses. So let, let me. Bonuses. I, that was that was sort of a complicated <coughs> question. Let me try it again. Yeah. Um, in general terms, when sale, uh, when the number of prescriptions, whether they were brand new prescriptions for new patients or prescriptions where a prescriber previously was writing for a competitor product and now is writing for a right. Mallinckrodt product. Uh, in general terms, when those numbers went up, the sales representatives' bonuses went up, right? 
contract has to form? Well, compensation was based on goal achievement. Mm -hmm. So uh, their compensation would have increased as their percent of goal achievement went up, if it did go up. And goal achievement was something objectively measurable? Uh, to the best of our, uh, for incentive compensation you're talking? Yes, sir. Yes. Just for incentive compensation, it was fairly objectively measured. Once again, it was you know a combination of components, potentially. Mm -hmm. I'd have to go look at the actual plan to, to see what it was, but uh, total TRXs frequently were a component of that. And what does that mean, TRX? Total prescriptions for a product. Okay. And I've seen the designation NRX. What does that mean? That would be new prescription. Okay. So total prescriptions, TRX minus NRX, would yield the number of prescriptions that were for a competitor's product that were now for Mallinckrodt product? Am I understanding that right? No, it would okay. have just been strictly as it relates to a, a Mallinckrodt product. Oh, I see. So new prescription doesn't mean a patient that wasn't previously taking any class of that drug. It just means new to the Mallinckrodt product? New to the Mallinckrodt product. It could have come from several different other products, but it always came from another opioid. In, in, in the instance of Exalgo, you mean? In the instance of Exalgo. Okay. So with respect to Exalgo, NRX means prescriptions that were previously being written for a competitor product and are now being written for Exalgo. Correct. Did you at Mallinckrodt have any uh, responsibility relating to generic drugs? I did not. So the sales department, uh, in, no, let me rephrase that. Did the sales department at Mallinckrodt when you were there have any responsibility for uh, promoting generic drugs? None at all. Who did that within the company? That was a generic division of the company, and it was a, not only a separate department, it was a separate business. Who, if you know, ran the generic division of the company while you were at Mallinckrodt? I really don't know. Did you ever ever have any interaction with that department? Um, there were, you know, maybe once a year there would be a, a corporate-wide meeting, mm -hmm. but nothing that specifically was involving our, our group. When you left Mallinckrodt, did you take any documents with you? No. Do you currently have any Mallinckrodt documents in your possession? No, no none that I can think of. Yeah, do you currently have a separation any agreement? Okay. Do you currently have any Covidian documents in your possession? I don't think so. Do you currently have any endo documents in your possession? Not that I'm aware of. You can cross that off your outline. <laughs> uh, you get paid extra for that? Yeah, I should. <laughs> should get a coffee or something out of it. Um, do you still have your separation agreement with Mallinckrodt? I do. Was there um, any provision in your separation agreement that says you're not allowed to say bad things about Mallinckrodt? Probably, but I don't recall specifically. It wouldn't have been stated exactly that way, I don't think. Yeah, the lawyers will get hold of it and make it much more complicated than that, I'm sure. No, no offense, Rocky, not you guys. Um, I'll, I'm going to ask if you would to um, produce your separation agreement to us, and uh, Rocky and I will talk about how to do that. But if you've still got it in your possession, which it sounds like you do, um, I'm going to ask for you to send it to um, 
I guess some Mallinckrodt lawyers, and then you can send it to us. We'll take that under advisement. Okay. Were you paid, um, I think I asked you this earlier, but were, were you paid a, a severance payment when you left Mallinckrodt? I don't recall that I was, no. Were you uh, prohibited as part of that agreement from going to work for a competitor for some period of time, sometimes called a non-compete agreement? I think I signed a non-compete agreement when I hired in with a company, mm -hmm. but not on departure. Okay. And you think the separation agreement may have had a non-disparagement clause or something like that? You know, I'd have to go back and look at it. Okay. I think it only, I think it only had to do with my ability to take any legal action against the company. I don't think it had anything to, to do with disparaging mm -hmm. remarks. Did you, um, were you contemplating legal action against the company? No. Had you uh, discussed with the company that you might take legal action against them at that point? No. Do you know why you signed a separation agreement if you were retiring? Uh, it didn't seem unusual to me, no. Did you have a lawyer representing you in that discussion? I did not. Do you have a lawyer here today representing you? I do. Who is that? Um, well, I have two teams of, of lawyers, um, Ropes and Gray and Arnold and Porter, mm -hmm. which represent uh, the companies that I work for. Okay. Do you have a written agreement with either of those law firms? Uh, yes. With which one? Both. Are you paying those lawyers? No, I'm not. Not personally. When did you sign the agreement with, let's talk about, with Ropes and Gray first? Um, I don't know, whenever we first met, I don't, it was at uh, August maybe. Okay, and how about with Arnold and Porter? Uh, that was more recent, uh, just a week ago, two weeks ago, something. What did you do to prepare for your deposition here today? Uh, I had the opportunity to meet with my attorneys. Okay, which ones? Uh, the ones that are uh, representatives from both Rubs and Gray and Arnold and Porter. Okay, when did you um, first start that preparation in terms mm -hmm. of meeting with lawyers? Well, the first meeting was whenever I signed that first engagement letter, which was back in July or August or whenever it was. Uh, when we thought that at that time that this uh, deposition was going to take place at an earlier date. Mm -hmm. Okay, and did you meet in person? Yes, uh, not not initially. Okay, initially you had a phone call? Yes. Okay, and then did you meet in person in the Fort Myers area? Yes, we did. Okay. For how long? Um, I think we met for... Better part, of, probably a day and a half. Okay. And who did you meet with? Do you remember um, the names? I met with both uh, Rocky and and Bill. Okay. Uh, and then, did you have other meetings since then with lawyers? Uh, we have had one other meeting when they were introducing me to the endo attorneys. So the Mallinckrodt lawyers introduced you to the Endo lawyers? Correct. Okay, when was that? Uh, that was a week ago, I think. Was that in person? That was. In Fort Myers area? It was. Do you live in Fort Myers? Uh, I live in a town called Estero, okay. which is just south of here. Um, on the next break, I'm going to ask you to write down your address. I'm not going to ask you to say it out loud, and we'll agree to keep it confidential. Okay. Um, and we'll mark that as exhibit number three. Remind me, please, if you would, to do that. Thank you. Um, okay, so a week ago you met with the lawyers for Endo and for Mallinckrodt? Correct. Okay. For how long did you meet? Um, 
I think it was once again about a day and a half. Might have been a day. The days are starting to run together. Yeah, I know that feeling. When, uh, and have you met since then with any no. lawyers? Just this morning when we met in the lobby. <clears throat> Did you talk on the phone with any lawyers to prepare for today, other than these meetings and the no. introductory phone call? No. No. Okay. Did you look at any documents? I did. Okay. How many documents did you look at, would you say? Maybe 30 from each company, from each uh, law firm. Were these documents that you had in your possession, or are these documents the lawyers showed you? The uh, attorneys had it. And I think they've been shared with you. I hope so. When you were at Mallinckrodt, did you go on any sales calls? I did. You did? Okay. On how many occasions would you guess? It was a regular occurrence or? Probably six times a year. Where did you do those, geographically speaking? All over. What was the purpose of going on the sales calls? Uh, it was really just more an opportunity to hear what our customers were saying about our products, get their feedback. Was one of the purposes of doing that, going on the sales calls, for you to evaluate the sales representative? No, it was not. Were there others who rode along with sales representatives for the purpose of evaluating the sales representative? The district managers, um, that was the, one of their primary responsibilities, was working with the salespeople directly on an ongoing basis, and they would uh, provide an evaluation uh, based on that time together. But your, uh, did they call them ride-alongs when you did it? Or? Yeah, something like that. Field trips. <laughs> okay. Um, where were you based when you were with Mellencrot? Um I was in St. Louis. So you would travel to other territories around the country to do these ride-alongs or field trips? Um, yes. Did they, you? they were usually not in locally, but I think there may have been at least one that was local. Did you ever do a ride-along in Ohio? <sighs> I think I actually did one in Columbus, Ohio. Any in northern Ohio? None that I recall. How did you determine where you did uh, the ride-alongs? Um, sometimes it was just uh, trying to provide some diversity of areas that I had gone. Um, I tried to make sure that I didn't just go to warm climates. <laughs> right. Uh, so I think I did go to Omaha, Nebraska once, mm -hmm. and um, you know probably in the winter. In uh, I don't recall whether it was winter or summer, <laughs> uh, but yes, I uh, I tried to get some good geographic distribution. Um, I tried to you know go with representatives that I thought um, could introduce me to you know customers that they had good relationships with and, and that they were well thought of. Uh, it usually wasn't somebody that um, that was you know new to the company or that I would put more stress on them that wasn't necessary. Did you ever do a ride along in Tennessee? Mm, I think I did. Do you remember which part of the state? Um, I think it was in Memphis. Was it just once or was it? Just once. Was the sales messaging the same for the entire country? Yes. 
So the messaging that a sales representative in Ohio would be given is the same as a sales representative in Alaska? Yeah, when you say um, sales message as it relates to the product, the yes, message sir. would have been the same as it relates to payer information. It certainly probably was different. Okay. In terms of the risks and benefits of a particular product, the sales messaging is the same regardless of, of the physical location. That would have been the same. Uh, you know, once again, all the sales materials were provided to representatives nationally that had all the standard um, you know, legal approvals that I described earlier. Okay, so the sales messaging for a product in Tennessee or Ohio or California or Alaska, they were all the same? Correct. I mean, to the best of our ability to monitor that. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, in one place, somebody may have put more emphasis on some aspects of the, of the message that they were more comfortable with or thought was, you know, more important to that customer. Our customers might have been slightly different, so. And that was in the discretion of the salesperson? That would have been at the discretion of the salesperson, but still using this, the approved promotional materials. And the approved promotional materials were the same throughout the country? Correct. Were sales representatives given, while you were at Mallinckrodt, any training for identifying prescribers who may have been over-prescribing opioids? Um, there was some training. Um, we had a, uh, an in a pharmacist from our scientific affairs group who um, you know, s spent time as part of the training, uh, describing kind of what that might look like, um, and under understanding a other aspects of just the pharmacy. Okay, when was that training done? It would have been done for new hires, so somewhere during the first month of their employment. Who was the person from Scientific Affairs who did I that I can't training. remember her name. It was a woman? It was a woman. Was it the same person during the four years you were at Mellencroft? I think it was. And part of that training was helping sales representatives identify uh, prescribers who may have been over-prescribing opioids? Um, it was, as I recall, it was training that um, helped to describe what uh, an office might look like uh, that had um, something suspicious going on. For example, um, plates, license plates on cars from multiple states or out of state within the parking lot. Um, people who would come in and out quickly who didn't seem like they had a very long visit with a physician and maybe more numbers than seemed appropriate for good assessment of patients. Mm -hmm. We then had a process uh, within our or sales organization for removing anybody that was suspicious and uh, there was uh, uh, also removal of any goal attainment that was associated with that physician uh, within their call plan. Okay, and what was the um process for a sales representative to report a suspicious prescriber? Uh, there were forms that they filled out that went into the kind of analytics department. Um, I think that it also had to meet with the approval of their district manager uh, so that they weren't just removing a physician because they couldn't get to that physician, mm -hmm. uh, but that it truly was someone that we thought, you know, was not... Um, where there might have been something suspicious going on. Do you recall that happening while you were at Mellencrot? Uh, it was an ongoing um, initiative, yes. Okay, I mean, in other words, do you recall any sales representatives reporting a suspicious prescriber up through this chain while you were at Mellencrot? Yes, oh yes, yes. Um, 
there were documents that were created to show who they were. Um, it wasn't all, it, there were, could have been, the, the report that I would get um, had multiple reasons, uh, such as the physician had died, physician had moved, uh, physician um, had lost their license, mm -hmm. or suspicious uh, prescribing. What was the form called? I, I don't remember uh, that there was a specific name for it. I'm sure there probably was, but. Was the, the form a, a form that could be used for removing a prescriber for any of those reasons? In other words, or was there? Yes, it was one form for yep. multiple reasons. Okay, so there wasn't a separate form created for removing a prescriber? No. Who was suspi for suspicious uh, reasons? It, it was done quarterly, usually. Okay. So there was just one form. Mark, we've been going about an hour since the last break. Just wanted to, yeah, and I'm okay. also uh, mad on court reporter. My uh, battery on my screen is running down as you asked me to note to you. Okay, why don't we take a break then? Okay. Time is 10:45 a.m. We're going off the record.